had a thought uh, that followed on from conversation last time that I wrote down in the following way. And um, it was something like, we often ask the question, what is it like to be X? Or is X the sort of thing that, that, can, that it can be like to be it? And I wondered about a, a, a slight um, variant on that question, uh, which um, cutely is, what is it like to have been X rather than to be X? And my intention of asking it that way is to place emphasis on the history of experience that X has had. What is it like to have been the kind of thing that has had the history of experience that X mm. has had? And that takes the question a little bit away from um, the tendency to say, what is X made of or how does X work? And instead to think of how has X been changed by the history that X has had. Um, and I wondered if, if putting a question that way uh, did any useful work for us. That was something I could say more about. Well, not a lot more, but I, that was something that was left, left hanging from last time for me. Um, so, uh, maybe I'm getting the cat by the balls, as they say. Um, <laughs> but um, when you first phrased it as you did now, um, in other words, uh, what was it like to be X? Um, I thought X therefore no longer exists. Uh, so would it not be what has it been like to be X? Uh, which implies X, uh, X still exists. Uh, yes, I didn't mean to imply that X doesn't exist anymore. Uh, I'm asking a question is, what is it like to have been the kind of thing that has had the experiences that X has had? Yeah. Hmm. Because uh, the, 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 I prefer that because the way that you formulated it uh, in the abbreviated version. It was too cute. Um, it, missed the, it missed the proper question, yes. It missed the, yeah. <laughs> it, it, not only does it imply that X no longer exists uh, and you're asking it from the grave, well, what was it like? Um, but also it, it, it removes the, 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 the qualia are no longer necessarily there. What was mm -hmm. it like? Uh, if, it, if it just is a, a readout of what it was like, uh, in, it, it, it's, well, I, I think that's a lesser point. Scratch that one. Anyway. Um, it's a very interesting nuance. What do you think, Mike? I, I love it. And I immediately went in the other direction because now I'm thinking a lot about, uh, you know, sort of um, f f the what's it like to do, right? I, th I think we talked about this last time. And so now I'm wondering, so, so putting it in, in your way, Richard, I'm wondering if there's another question, which is what is it like to be something that, anticipates things happening to it right that something that must act and is not indifferent to what happens next so you know exactly what you're saying but sort of looking looking forward so what's it like to be something that has that level of uh investment in what happens next something like that you know of course two sides of the same coin i guess but but i i like it a lot um and it also seems to take the, the the emphasis off of right. So so a lot of ways to think about this are you know there's only the present now and it's sort of what you are now and all that. And this sort of aims it outwards and says you know yeah it it felt to me like it yeah. takes that it that it immediately takes the pressure off its current structure, its mm -hmm. current material mm -hmm. being, mm -hmm. its mm -hmm. current um, material forms. Like what is it like to be X? It's like it's just too easy to jump in and say what X is made of and how X is constructed and how X mm -hmm. works and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. And when you think, when you pose it more historically or as to generalize it in the way that you suggest more temporarily extended way, um, I wonder if you can say it both ways at once. What, what is it like to, I keep reaching for have been. What is it like to uh, be a system that has had that kind of experience that it is carrying forward with some sort of expectation about the future 
and trying trying to do trying to do both at once, but make it temporarily extended instead of yeah. just in yeah. the moment. You know uh, what's occurring to me now, uh, as I, as I think further about this, is uh, firstly to 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 be a system uh, that has temporal depth. In other words, to be a system that that has learned from ex from its experiences. Um, if that has been affected by its experiences, yeah. um, is is a system which is updating itself. On, it's changing its mind, as it were. Uh, it's changing its 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 mental structure. It's changing its its uh, control system for whatever you want to call it on the basis of uh, past um, events to it that that it affected it. In other words, unless the events mattered to it they would not have there's no reason to believe they would have been recorded in the way that that's implicit in the question yeah um and there would be no any system that has such a history um would have such a future uh because it's that kind of system mm. i don't think mike that a system has to know that it is changing its mind in order to anticipate the future mm -hmm. it might it's 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 perfectly i would think it's sufficient that it yeah. changes its mind yeah. uh, in other words it changes its actions its policies based on past events yeah. that means it is going to change its policies in relation to future events whether it knows it or not so i think that the the linguistic uh, gymnastics that you get stuck in, that you were just getting stuck in, Richard, I think they can be avoided just by saying, you can ask the question in either direction, but I think that the simplest one is to ask it in the, in, in the past tense. What in the, I don't know what that's called, past, past participle or something, uh, uh, the, the, the one where you say, what has it been like you know, to be X? I mean, we could even go. We could even go more minimal than that and say, "What's it like to be something to which things can happen?" Right? It's you don't even have to. You can go super minimal and not even know. You know, not know that you're changing your mind. Not be able to predict awfully much. But but you know, uh, yeah, to be the subject of of possible future happenings. To uh, but but that way. was you just changed it to object though. Yeah. What was it like to what is it like to be a sort not you you took out the what is it like to be part yeah yeah yeah, and yeah. Just said, uh what kind of a system can can um be acted on yeah yeah you're right i i had a a a, a few months ago a brief conversation with a colleague with a humanities background i think it's, she's some sort of literary scholar and she was getting very exercised about this way of speaking. This, um, this, um, I suppose it is a Nagel come Chalmers way of speaking. You know, this what is it like? Um, she objected to what to, to it on the grounds that it implies some sort of um, some sort of as ifness. Uh, it's, it's 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 not what is it to be, but rather what is it like to be. In other words. What, that, that was the way that she was reading it uh, as a as a literary person, and she said, "Why don't you just say what is it to be?" Um, but that mm -hmm. takes away the first person perspective. Yeah, because we mean, what does it feel like to be, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so I suppose it would be how how does it feel to be? How so, does it how, how does it feel to be X, or, or how has it felt to be X? So I noticed that there's there's when I think about how a system has been changed by its experience, uh, I immediately reach into the machine learning sort of territory or learning theory territory and notice that, you know, so what is it, what is it like to be a neural network that's been trained on XOR, right? What is it like to have, what's it like to have been a thing that's had that past experience, right? And there's something that you can say, or what's it like to have been changed by that past experience? What what kind of a, what 
yeah, I don't want to get too hung up on the words. But I noticed that the way in which it behaves in the future uh, is interesting from a machine learning point of view, exactly because of the ways in which it behaves, which are not determined by its past experience. In other words, the ways in which it generalizes. So there can be many networks that have had the same past experience that you, you could have given them exactly the same training data. And because they generalize differently, that's exactly the way in which they generalize differently is exactly what they brought to the table that wasn't in their past experience. Um, which kind of undermines the validity of the question that I started with, that it's not just, it's, it perhaps it isn't just what's it like to be a system that has had that kind of past experience, but uh, what is it like to be a system, what is it like to be that system in a way that isn't described exactly by the past experience that it's had? But that, you know, that has a really interesting flavor, which you and I have been talking about anyway, in other contexts of uh, getting more out than you put in, sort of, right? That, that it's, uh, it's, it's this, um, how do I put this? It's, uh, it, it's, it's not that it wasn't the past experience, but it, it wouldn't have been able to unlock whatever this is that it now brings to the table if it weren't for that past experience, right? It's sort of a two-part thing it's your experience that allows you to mm. sort of now even stuff that wasn't directly i mean I, i'm not saying anything that's not obvious but but i that's what i, I feel like there's a two-parter in yeah because your inductive bias was there before you started but your ability to generalize wasn't mm. your ability to generalize on this problem wasn't right mm. you needed mm. to you needed to transform your inner model with that inductive bias to that experience and that transformation is it's it can be deterministic given where you started from mm -hmm. including your inductive bias and the experience that you've had but it's not determined by the experience that you've had mm -hmm. and neither was it apparent before you had that experience right you know it's just like well, you know, it was the data plus it was a past money pressure. It's like, so the past money pressure predicted what I should do in this case? Like, no, <laughs> you're like, yeah. no, you still needed yeah. the experience. And it's, it, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it's not like you can, you can take the set of all networks that have been trained on the same data and say, uh, okay, but the way that this one generalizes is different from that one because it, you can you can't just read that directly from its inductive bias you have to so so this this it's, it's amazing that uh, this this actually gets exactly into something that i was going to ask and um i think i think uh, mark could give a a, a a slant on this that probably i i haven't heard before which is um it's related to this this thing that keeps coming up uh which is which is the kind of the, the free will question Right. And people ask me this all the time. And, the, the, you know, there are many ways to butcher it, but I'm, I'm interested in how, how what, what you guys would say about it. Um, you know, so I typically then just press for a definition, like, are you trying to be free from your own psychological drives or free from physics? Or what are you trying to be, you know, what free, free from what exactly? But I just wonder, you know, like, like, so, so for example, uh, Mark, what would you say, uh, you know, maybe, maybe to a client in psychoanalysis or to anybody, like, what's your you know, what's your, what is there a useful definition of that? And what, what do you think about um, these issues of control? Because I think it gets to exactly what, what you were talking about, Richard, right? You got this past history, then there's some other stuff you bring to the table. And so what's the, what's the useful version of I could have done otherwise in this, in this scenario? Um, well, let me tell you the first thing that, that uh, comes to my mind in relation to this question. Um, the way that I look on uh, the question of free will, which I don't think is anything particularly profound, my, my way of looking on it, um, is that, uh, first of all, it's, the, the, it's probabilistic. In other words, um, there are greater or lesser uh, uh, chances that one will do A or B or C. Um, the, 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 then the, those degrees of um, of probability uh, are determined uh, for a system of the kind that that I'm interested in. In other words, a conscious system, 
uh, it, it's determined by its feelings. Um, feelings um, go govern uh, how uh, negative affect means you're moving away from your preferred states, in other words, from your viable bounds. Uh, positive affects mean you're moving back into your preferred states, back towards your, your viable bounds. Um, so the chances of you doing something um, are uh, increased uh, if they if what you're doing feels pleasurable, uh, and they are decreased if what you're doing feels unpleasurable. Uh, it doesn't mean you won't do it, uh, is the point um, that I'm making. It just means you're less likely to do it. So to use the biblical example um, of Daniel in the lion's den, uh, Daniel chooses to enter the lion's den, which is a very unlikely thing to do. Um, so Daniel did it. That's evidence of free will. Uh, he, uh, he, he, he did it anyway. But, but there are very few Daniels. So, you know, this sort of behavior, um, you can uh, uh, um, indulge in it, but you're very unlikely to. And it's in that sense that I understand free will and, 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 its, and its relationship to feeling. Um, and I think that the only reason why uh, there would be such individuals um, is because we, we have a multiplicity of feelings. In other words, we have a multiplicity uh, of competing needs and uh, so what satisfies one uh, uh, um, homeostatic drive um, may have the opposite effect uh, on other homeostatic drives. And so it's a matter of prioritizing them and that will be context sensitive. And so, you know, here's how, you, how this sort of thing arises, that something uh, at one point in time, uh, which may be very unlikely, um, is not so unlikely for this particular system uh, given uh, its history and given the context that it's in and given the, the current relationship uh, between its various homeostatic needs. Does that begin to address the question that you're asking, Mike? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, th there, are there are kind of two aspects, right? So, so some people are really into the science of it and they say, yeah, but uh, you know, physics, I mean, um, in the end, it's all, uh, you know, particles zooming around, right? So what do we really have? And then, and then there are the people that are more interested on the personal side. Okay, given all the stories, right? The physics stories, the sort of story that you just told and all that, what does it mean for us as individuals? Am I, you know, are we just, is this sort of a, 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 a some kind of a, uh, in an, in an inevitable story being worked out, or should I be in some way? And I, I mean, I point out, well, you don't have a choice about it, but but should I be worried about actually, you know, doing things, or ugh, it's all it's all sort of pre-written that that kind of thing, right? People people come at. As I just wonder, like in particular, I mean, do you you know when you deal with with patients and so on, do you come across people who are um, who, who who really buy into the the sort of determine the hard determinist story and what effect does that have in their life and how do you you know what what do you do then? Well, um, so let me say two things. Uh, the, and you're making it easier for me when you ask me to speak as a clinician because clinicians can speak very loosely. Um, but but before I do that, um, let me just remind you that. The explanation or the account that I just gave of free will, simple as it was, uh, and mechanistic as it was, uh, it, it nevertheless, uh, feelings play a central role in it. So it's not excluding the subject uh, of the mind uh, when I put it the way that I did. I place the emphasis on feelings for very good reason. You know, when I speak of homeostat, there are many homeostats uh, that I do not think uh, have. Uh, uh, have these ex this extended functionality which gives rise to feeling. So it's a special kind of homeostasis that we're talking about um, where there is palpating of uncertainties, uh, in, in other words, modulating of, of, of precisions in the, in the different policies relating to the different homeostats and then the relationship between them. So th that said, uh, let me speak now as a clinician. Um, uh, the, the, the thought that comes to mind immediately when you put it to me that way uh, is that many, and I'm speaking now both um, from the point of view of individual experience uh, and from the point of view of having to give expert testimony 
uh, about whether or not somebody's responsible for their actions. Um, and, and, and sometimes it's not just a matter of a binary question of yes or no, um, which is a sort of forensic psychiatric question of a quite simple kind. It's got to do with you know, their, their defined criteria. But, but also in terms of mitigation of sentence, it, it becomes a, a more, a more um, a, a gray uh, question. It's not yes or no, it's a matter of to what degree and why uh, is this person, uh, or are we to take mercy on this person? And, and so what, what it boils down to, the, 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 the position that I've found myself coming to uh, is first of all, there are two factors. First of all, I think that it's undoubtedly so that um, our hi individual histories um, for which we are not responsible, those aspects of it for which we are not responsible, which are huge, like what, what uh, family we are born into, uh, what, what personalities and socioeconomic status uh, and so on our parents have. Um, uh, the, these are, we can't possibly be held responsible for that. And things that are perpetrated upon us by those families and uh, and, the, and the environments that we find ourselves in. It's undoubtedly uh, uh, obviously true that, that these influences exist, that we can't be held responsible for them, and that they will have a powerful determining um, effect on the, the likelihood uh, that we will, for example, uh, indulge in criminal behavior. So you are much more likely to indulge in criminal behavior uh, if it's been the norm uh, in the in this social setting that you uh, grew up in and where there's an imperative, uh, for example, to um, steal or to uh, behave violently <clears throat> because otherwise you're not gonna, you're not gonna get by, you know? So you can't be held responsible for all of that. Um, so that's the one factor. The second factor is that yes, indeed. So it's, it, it's more difficult for person A, um, to resist uh, criminal uh, action than person B. But ultimately, in the end, it is their responsibility. So it's not a, it's not a matter of, you know, um, do, do, do we or do we not um, take sympathy on, on person A because of their history? We do. We say it's been much harder for you uh, to do what is right. Uh, in other words, to obey the law, to, to keep that matter simple. It's much harder for you, but still it is your responsibility to do so. Uh, and so ultimately it is uh, a, a matter of choice. It's a li little bit like what I was saying earlier about free will, that there are uh, probabilistic factors which, which weight the likelihood much more uh, in case A than in case B that they're going to follow a certain course of action. But ultimately it's up to them to decide whether or not they will follow that course of action. So, so, so that's the thought that, um, and, and, and that's based on my experience with these things. You know, when you're when you're dealing with the patient, you really do, you realize, oh my God, the the the, 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 the cards were really stacked against this person. What a what a tragic history. Uh, but um, you know, there are many such people with such histories, and some choose one uh, route out of it, and others choose another. And and that isn't due to the history entirely. It's got something. It's something that you do hold the patient responsible for or the, or the perpetrator responsible for. Uh, it's, yeah. Yeah. So what do you, th what do you think, Richard? I mean, it's got both of these things, right? They've got this case, this, this flavor of there's the part that's determined by your past history of inputs, and then there's the other part that is brought to the table somehow, right? So what do you think about that? Do we have some kind of minimum? Yeah, I noticed, to me, it felt like there was a, there was a little slippage in the middle there about, um, we appreciate the history stacks the cards one way or the other, but um, the law requires us to determine that you don't do this or you do do that. And therefore it was a choice. Uh, but that but was it though right you know it's like you know the 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 law assumes that that it must have been a choice otherwise you can't hold anybody guilty right you can't hold anybody responsible for their actions unless there was a choice unless there was free will but maybe that whole edifice doesn't make sense um you know we if 
if we were to imagine that the edifice of law was built on a folk psychology of a free will that doesn't exist, we can't use that as an as reason to believe that they had a choice. Yes, uh, that's why I, I agree with you that there's slippage there. And I think that that slippage is the interesting part of it because uh, remember what I said at the outset, I said, I'm glad to be allowed to speak as a clinician because clinicians can speak loosely. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you notice that I moved from being a clinician to being an expert witness clinician, uh, because <laughs> yeah. I, I have I have found that a terribly interesting experience. You know that uh, a clinician, um, all you have to do is understand how did the patient come to be who they are now, um, and and if it's your patient, uh, your job is to help them. You know, uh, uh, it's it's not to to judge them, but right. rather to help them to live a life uh, that is more satisfactory for them. What is satisfactory for them does include the impact they have on other people, which rebounds upon them. So it's not, you know, an, an, an entirely solipsistic thing that. Uh, but when you're in a court of law, I've always found it really interesting that the judge has to decide, you know, uh, this was or was not, uh, the person was or was not responsible for this. Um, the, the, this, And they have these quaint notions like, what is reasonable? You know, what would a reasonable person do? And, and they have to decide this is or it is not reasonable. And, and it's, it, it has a kind of sobering effect on the clinician when you, you realize they can't get away with uh, just saying, well, you know, th this, th th we can understand why this person did that. That's not the point. The point is, yeah. are they to be held responsible? And there has to be a binary answer. Yeah. And um, so... The, the 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 I think the very I mean on the one hand we can throw stones at you know the folk psychology that that the law um, rests upon but on the other hand uh, you know if you take seriously what the law is there to do what it, what its task is um, you know then it has it it can't afford to not uh, have some sort of simple criteria and I I, I think that there is. You know, it's a very easy way of addressing the very question that, that we're talking about. I mean, can we really have a situation in which, because uh, you can trace uh, more or less deterministically, I mean, including probabilistic causes, you can you can trace more or less why the person came to be who they are. Does that absolve them of any responsibility? Does it mean that you know there is no such thing as one being responsible for one's actions? I I, I find it hard to imagine how we can live in a society in which we believe that. Mm. Mm. Because everybody is who they are because of their history. But I find it very interesting. Uh, the, the, uh, evidently, you're drawing on earlier conversations. And remember all the time, I, I, I'm not in your field. You know, so there, there are things that you just take for granted that I don't even know about. Um, but I found it very interesting what the two of you were saying earlier, the way you were conceptualizing it, that it's not just a matter of what the history is of the system. Uh, it's a matter of what the system brings to that history based on its own, its own priorities or its own tasks. Um, I think that's a very interesting way. Or its own physical makeup, yeah. 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 There's, there's a notion, um, uh, there's a couple of things come to mind there. I've been playing with this phrase, the history of the system, the whole system and nothing but the system, <laughs> which, which resonates quite nicely with our imagining being in court for a moment. Uh, that um, you can take a really simple example, like, like a neural network learning XOR. And there are basically two ways in which a simple one hidden layer neural network can can learn XOR. One is that it puts two decision boundaries like this, and the other is that it puts two decision boundaries like that. But so long as you've cut off two of the corners, you can do XOR okay. But the difference between this and that is well, what do you, what answer do they give in the middle? They give opposite answers for what they give in the middle. The way they generalize differently beyond the training data. And if you um, initialize uh, such a network and train it from initially small random weights. Can you explain why whether it's going to be whether it's going to generalize this way or that way? Right. Well, you can't explain it with the data 
because the data says that they're equally good. Uh, you can't explain it with um, the sort of architecture of the network because it was the same architecture in both cases. You could say, well, but if you had initialized them exactly the same, then they would have they would have generalized, they would have necessarily become out exactly the same. So the initial conditions of the weights does seem to be playing a part. But you can also see that the uh, when you look at why is this hidden neuron doing this decision boundary and not that decision boundary? Well, that's that decision boundary only makes sense if the other one is doing this one. And this one only makes sense if the other one is doing that one. So they're doing it because they are a symmetry of each other. Uh, there isn't any way to explain why hidden node one is doing this boundary, this boundary, this boundary, or this boundary. They're all equally likely. But there's a symmetry breaking involved, which is about being complementary to the other hidden node. And that's something which is happening inside the network. It's something which is um, uh, about that, that sensitive dependence on initial conditions and the symmetry breaking dynamics which happen inside it are, um, well, at the very least, uh, it becomes less and less a function of its own initial conditions and more and more a function of its own internal state. Uh, that, you know, after it's become a little bit like this, it becomes much easier, much more likely that it comes out like that than that it suddenly flips to generalizing the other way. So the reason that the network says that the point in the middle of feature space is or isn't in XOR, right, they give opposite answers for that point in the middle, is uh, a function of the history of the system, like what, what training has it had. It's of the whole system because the reason that it has this decision boundary can't be separated from the presence that the other neuron has that decision boundary. It can't, you can't separate it into parts. And nothing but the system in the sense that there isn't, there isn't anything. Uh, you're exactly interested in the part which is not explained by the history or the history of external inputs to the system. So that's why I'm about the history of the system, the whole system, and nothing but the system. And that's, that's, you need that, you need that thing. I need a short way of saying it now, the history of the system, the whole system, nothing but the system, to explain why they did that. Why did they do that behavior? Why did they say yes for this answer and not no for that answer? Um, and I feel like you, you know, if you have, if you have that in something as simple as <laughs> one hidden layer neural network learning XOR, right? It's, you know, it's no wonder um, uh, no wonder we find it difficult to ascertain whether or not it was history or something intrinsic to the system which takes responsibility for what happened, right? Like if you, like if it couldn't if it couldn't have been otherwise, then you say you're not responsible, right? Well, could it have been otherwise? Well, like when everything that happened was deterministic, so in that sense, it couldn't have been otherwise. But, but the reason that it came out this way and not some other way was not really a function of its experience at all. I mean, the other ingredient there is the nature of the the exorness of the problem, right? It's the sort of the nature of the problem space. And, and what I was thinking about, you know, you know, people in in terms of the for the the will question, people often try to imagine okay what would it like to be what, what what could there be a universe with you know with with no free will and then could what would a universe with actual like free will look like i'm wondering it, it, could we have a universe in which that kind of generalization doesn't work what what would we have to break mm. for for that not to work anymore Sorry, what would we have to break for what not to work? work anymore? The generalization, right? So, so Richard started out with this really good example of the fact that when the network learns to, to generalize, what it's doing is bringing something new to the table that literally wasn't in the training data. Right? There's an extra, you know, something that you're getting out of it because now it can work on novel, novel inputs that it hasn't seen before. So I'm wondering, uh, is there a way to break that? Is there a world in which, uh, I an mean, imaginable world in which that does not work, that all you ever get is the inputs you've seen before, where that extra bit doesn't happen? Yeah, good. 
So it depends on whether you care about what outputs it gives to things you hadn't been trained on, right? So a, a, a simple place to start is, well, I trained my network to do XOR. It correctly gives the truth table for XOR, job done. And you never ask the question of what does it do if I give it an input that wasn't in the corners of the hypercube, right? I just don't, I just don't ask that question. And then I just wouldn't care about what it brought to the table that wasn't in the history of the system. So, uh, and there's something there about, uh, there's something, there's something observer dependent in it, because why do I care what answer it gives? What, what, you know, is there a right answer or a wrong answer for, for rows of a table that, that wasn't in the training data? It's like, well, you didn't, you know, it wasn't, it just like these two networks are really are equivalent, even though they generalize differently, they really are equivalent because the only ways in which they're different are ways which weren't determined by the data, right? So if I think that, no, but wait, but this one is generalizing correctly, this one has a true model of the world and this one doesn't, right? If there's something, if there's something that matters to me about the way that this one generalized versus the way that that one generalized, this one broke the law and this one didn't, uh, then that suggests that I know something about the real world from which the data was drawn uh, that wasn't in the training regime. And I want to know whether this system sees the world the same way I do. Like if I was given that training data, I would have said that the middle point was in the class, but they said the middle point wasn't in the class. And that means they are not like me. And therefore I can hold them responsible for their actions, right? The way the way in which they behaved wasn't the way I would have done it or something like that. Can you really hold somebody responsible or guilty for something if you really believe that in the same situation you would have done it? I think you, maybe you can. Well, if you're willing to hold yourself. To yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's uh, categorically yeah. imperative. Yeah, it's like it, I am. Um, no, if I know I completely agree. If I'd been in that situation, I would have totally done that. But thank goodness I wasn't. So, but you're here and not me. So off you go. <laughs> uh, yeah, but there's so there is something there, I think, about um, uh, the way when if we acknowledge that a system can bring something to the table that isn't in their history, then there's something about does. Do, do I, does the way in which they generalize make sense to me, right? Because then there's the, there's the two of us involved in the system, the observer and the system. It's not, there isn't a way of saying this system was bringing something meaningful to the table and that system wasn't just because they generalized differently. I can only say that, but I can say something like, this system generalized in the way that I would have generalized, right? Or this system didn't generalize in the way that I would have generalized. And that makes it somehow, I know more about what it's like to be them than I do about the one that generalized differently from me. Yeah, I keep, I, I keep uh, being pulled to this issue of the structure of the space, right? It's like, if you if you learn to generalize the a, a rule that derives uh, prime numbers, let's say that once you've done that, you, there's a whole you know sort of infinitude of these things that you can keep on generating beyond uh, what you've seen so far. And the structure, the explanation for why you say the things you say, in part, in part it's your history, your structure, but in part it's the it's the pattern of prime numbers such as it is, right? It's just not that that's neither your structure nor your inputs. It's just the sort of external nor the observer. I don't know. So that's that's an interesting. So that that's you know, a different funny... observer. Those numbers are not special. Y yeah, right. Yeah, you know, that's the crux of your point. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you know? Um, there was a. I wish I could remember the exact. Um, Shoot, I remember the exact book, but uh, you know there was this uh, there was this case of um, a savant syndrome. I don't know, Mark. You may have, you may have know about this. There were these two these two brothers who um, they were uh, you know sort of severely disabled in most aspects, and they never went to school or anything like that. But what they would do is they would sit there with each other and they would just say prime numbers back and forth to each other. That's just what they they would do. 
and and the the, the guy investigating them went and got a, a book a table of of uh and, and they wouldn't really they weren't really into talking to anybody else and but he got this he got this this book that was just like a list of prime numbers and he he said some and they included him in the circle so they would go like you know three way right and then his book ran out he got to the end of the book and he couldn't do it anymore and then they were like that that was it and then they wouldn't talk to him after after that <laughs> after he couldn't do it but you know but but it's such an it's such an interesting thing because somewhere in there i mean so they hadn't been to school to to, to learn what the significance of that is but there was something in there that was sort of generating these things and they were pulling it out and they could they could do it better than the than, than the almanac he had so yeah, i don't know um there's i mean yes there's definitely needs to be an observer but but it's yeah it's it still feels like it's not any old list of numbers right even if you have an observer it's it's there's a specific structure to it hmm. so there's there's something there that i've said i've said before about uh how is it possible that that anything can can generalize right so how is it possible that anything has an appropriate inductive bias for generalizing without having already tested that inductive bias to see how good it was at generalizing right the sort of cross validation method and it's like but if you if you've already tested it to see how good it is at generalizing you're not doing generalization anymore right you're just you're just you know trying a different bunch of sets and seeing which one worked best so how is it possible how can it ever be possible that an, in, an inductive bias works in a way that hasn't been proved by the data it's sort of by definition it can't be proved by the data mm. Mm. but so how does so how does learning work then how do organisms ever survive in the in in the natural world how do i ever learn anything how do brains ever work and the rest of it how does machine learning work on data sets you haven't seen before? And I think there's, so the, what I've been saying about that is because they're, they're built from stuff of the same universe. They don't have to be built from literally the same stuff, but they're built from stuff of the same universe. That a brain might be a causal network that happens to be built out of neurons and synapses but it's still a sort of network of pairwise interactions that's like the network of pairwise interactions out there in the world that it's trying to understand whether that's interactions between people or between objects or between uh elements of the selective environment or whatever whatever environment that is that the organism is in and if they weren't built from the same kind of stuff induction would be impossible uh so there's for me there's something there about uh being able to intuit what it is to be you based on uh whether i think you and i come from the same universe I think what I was reaching for there was that although um, prime num prime numbers aren't aren't arbitrary because they're they're from the same universe of possibilities that you know that in in this universe at least factors are meaningful things and the absence of factors is a meaningful thing. Uh, No, I lost it. Hmm. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's really interesting, and 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 that, that again that makes me ask. It makes me think about. So, what does it take to break that? Right in in what universe? Like, what's the alternative universe? Right where that doesn't work? Because you, I, I think uh, you could change all the you know struck with all the constants of the of physics and everything. I think. In fact, I think the number stuff would still be exactly what it is, right? I mean, does that? Is yeah, there... So you first raised that question in the context of what would a universe be like that didn't have where free will wasn't possible and a universe where free will was possible, right? I mean, that's another, right. That's, that's, yeah. that's another way that people ask this is like, I mean, one, 
you know, so so, so Dennett in his um, in his uh, early early book on 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 free will points out that look in, in terms of physics we know two things we know determinism and we know random you know quantum randomness and that's it and neither of those things look like free will to us so voila right it doesn't exist that's his argument and so so I think it's important to to sort of ask do do we have a coherent version of like what would a universe be where where everyone could say oh yeah boy in that world you you know you really do have have proper free will like what that even look like so that's what that's why I ask these questions about you know these counterfactual worlds mm. Hmm. And well, please. No, it's just this is going to be one of those. This is going to be like our last conversation. I'm going to spend a, a lot of time after this meeting uh, uh, thinking. It is extremely, uh, extremely interesting questions that you're raising. Yeah, because because right because uh, you know also so so Richard brings up this point that we're sort of we're from the same universe. So how far does that go, right? Does that mean that every possible being in this universe, so all of our synthetic agents, the aliens, the whatever you know crazy architectures are out there that right? So so we're all good. We're all part of that same set. We can all sort of sympathize with each other and all that. And so now the question is, is there some other universe somewhere where that wouldn't be the case, right? And if and if you know, where's the border where if, if, if something showed up from that universe, you'd be like, ah, there's no way, you know, we just can't. Yeah. You know. So that would be a universe where things that were not from the same universe could meet each other. And in, in that universe, there would just be deterministic stuff and random stuff and nothing in between. Hmm. Because the, the, the way in which you did something that wasn't obviously determined by your history when you did something that was obviously determined by your history there was nothing to explain and when you didn't it was just random because there was just no structure in it that i could possibly understand that what what you do that's that's um not determined by your history has no structure in it at all that i can see with my history something like that yeah and then it and then it would be purely my my ability to induce what induction you're doing would be zero something like that because i mean because hmm. you also you also asked how far does this go right that um you do you know uh life from other parts of the unit of this universe are still from the same universe so we would get that right we would get them but you don't have to go that far right because the kind of induction that rocks do doesn't make any sense to me right they they appear to either be deterministic or random to me but they don't have enough shared history with me for me to understand what sort of what what kind of induction is this rock doing just doesn't just can't see it well, that's super it, interesting it may right? as well be random numbers instead of prime numbers right i just can't yeah. see it that's super interesting because that's that sounds uh, exactly the way that um some some of the people in my field uh, will uh, think about cells too like that's the right that's not at all the kind of thing that i do they just i don't get it i don't see i don't see how you could possibly see this as, as a cognitive anything like it's just it, you know they, they would they would group cells tissues they would they would group all of that with a with with the rocks on this on this scenario mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's exactly what they say when I start talking about, you know, cells making decisions and whatever. And they say, well, how about rocks? You, you know, what, what, you know, that's a question number one is, well, what about rocks? I mean, it, yeah. it literally is in the same in the same bin. Yeah, but because you've spent a lot of time in cell world thinking about things that cells care about, you their their generalizations make more sense to you. Like they're not just saying random numbers to you; they're saying prime numbers. That's very interesting too, because. Because a lot of the people who, who who feel this way, it's not that they've spent less time staring at cells than I have, right? They do the same stuff, uh, but they get something out, something different out of it. They they've reached, they they've seen this, the the same data, and they've they've reached the right. It's kind of like yeah, 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 exactly <laughs> right, exactly right. Wow, yeah, never thought of that before. Mm. Amazing, amazing. Hmm. Hmm. what was next on your list mike well the next thing is um 
uh, I was going to ask you. I, I was going to ask you, Mark, whether do you know? Um, and this is this is com well, maybe I think completely shifting topics, but I guess we'll see. Uh, do you know the Lorber cases of the the hydrocephaly Lorber cases? Hydrocephaly. You mean hydranencephaly? I, well, I, so I could be getting this wrong. You can you can tell me. So so there's a couple of papers from the 1980s where this guy named Lorber, he, and, and one of the papers is called, Is Your Brain Really Necessary? And so what he was studying was the rare, the, the, the very rare cases of adults with drastically reduced brain volume that had normal or above normal IQ. So, so right. So, so there was one, and I believe I even saw this guy interviewed on TV when I, when I was a teenager in the 80s, where uh, they said, I think they said he had less than a third of the of the cortex matter of a chimp or something like this, and the guy was in a master's program for math. I mean, you wouldn't know, right? So totally normal, but 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 you know, actual brain volume radically, re and it's because of the water, you know, the water pressure and all that. Yeah. So, yeah. What, what do you what do you make what, what do you make of cases like that? Because you know, people will say, well, redundancy, but if that was all it is, I, you know, I don't think we'd have such huge heads, and, and right, if you could get away with less. I don't, I don't see why, why we would, why most people would have such, I mean, it's a problem, right? It's, it's a huge problem. It's, it's a problem to have big heads and all that. So was, so what do you make of that? What's, what's with these, these cases? Yeah. Um, so that is hydrocephaly rather than hydranencephaly. Um, and uh, the, it's the, the standard answer to, to question. I, I'm, I'm not going to contribute very much. I'm afraid, Mike, the standard answers uh, are twofold. Uh, the one has to do with um, with uh, the 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 mode of onset of the pathology. So it, the 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 what we are talking about there uh, in the, in in terms of the hydrocephaly, uh, it's it's not unique to hydrocephaly. You know there there are many other pathologies, like for example meningiomas, uh, mm. which grow very slowly um, and uh, take up. Uh, ultimately an enormous amount of cranial volume, thereby compressing uh, what else is there. Just as in the case of hydrocephaly, the CSF, the cerebrospinal fluid, compresses the parenchymal tissue, uh, so too can a, a, a rampant meningioma. Um, and uh, if, it's a, if it's a sufficiently slow or constant uh, factor uh, in the uh, organism's uh, development, uh, then it does, it simply organizes itself in relation to that. Um, and so that's the one, the one standard answer is it has to do with the natural history of the pathology. Uh, and, and then the other, which is, which is fairly closely related, but not quite the same thing, uh, is it depends on how early in the development, uh, the, uh, the taking something away um, is very different from, uh, from having to adjust to something that's there from the beginning. So, um, I mean, I've had many cases. I had a case of a, pa a patient who came to me um, who, who had a bicycle accident, minor bicycle accident. And uh, because he went to a private hospital, they did all sorts of investigations on him that were totally unnecessary uh, because they could charge for them. Um, and uh, he was a very successful uh, business person. And uh, it, 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 the, the investigations that were done on him included the MRI scan, which revealed that he had no left hemisphere, never had had a left hemisphere. You know, and there he was as a very successful person. And uh, he, he just needed reassurance from me that it, you know, he really is normal. I mean, how can it be possible? I have almost literally half a brain. Um, and the answer is, well, it's because you've always had only half a brain. You know, so your brain developed around the fact that there's no left hemisphere. And so every, the hemispherectomies uh, performed in very young children um, and everything that was going to go to the left hemisphere, I mean, everything, including uh, you know, motor control of the right side of the body, uh, including um, the rep, uh, you know, uh, occipital lobe representation of, of, the, of the retina, it all just shifts over to the other side. Hmm. So, as I said, I'm not giving you a very deep answer, but but those are. It's not entirely surprising that you have a person who's got a chronic hydrocephaly, whose cortex is is very compressed, which is not ideal. Uh, but they've been able to compensate uh, the, the, because it's always been like that. It's a constant factor in their development. Yeah. 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 I mean, maybe this is uh, you know we're almost out of time, so I'd love to pick this up next time because. 
I, I understand the, the the plasticity and the and and all of that, but you know certainly I think in in on the in on the computer side we're told that there's a certain density of 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 work you you're going to get out of a, a, a certain amount of of medium right and oh we're going to need more you know GPUs we're going to need more memory like it takes an amount of medium to fit a certain performance and if I say well don't worry you know I'll give you uh, half of that but 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 we can start that way from the beginning well you know for, that's not going to work on the on the engineering side right so so this question of I mean, clearly it's not infinite. You can't have infinite density of capacities per whatever cubic millimeter. So, so I'm really interested in that aspect of it. Now, if, if you really can fit everything, if this guy is a successful businessman and he's riding a bicycle and he's doing all this stuff, you can really fit all that into one hemisphere. Like what the, I, I, I just, I, I find it, I don't know, how, you know, well, what's the minimum you can, what's the density of competencies per, per unit volume? I, I don't, I don't get it. So anyway, maybe, maybe we can we can talk about that next time. Yeah. Well, as always, you ask questions that uh, that uh, that I don't normally get asked, and so it's <laughs> it's really it, it's really useful to be asked such questions because otherwise, I, I you know I, I truly have never thought about what you've just said now. Uh, the the uh, just two things I know, as you say, we're almost out of time, but just two further footnotes really to uh, to this question uh, is that. It's not um, the, the one is it's not infinite. Uh, this it's 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 a matter uh, also of you know you have to have something of the stuff uh, you can't do without all of it. So for example, you you can, you can have you can have no left hemisphere or no right hemisphere. The other one will take over. But if you have no hemispheres, uh, the brain stem can't take over what hemispheres do. So um, there's there's a limit to to the to the, the principle that we're discussing um and uh, the other which is a, again really just a small footnote is that the differences in size um of the brain um the, the individual differences and if i may say so uh, because it's such a delicate topic they're also gender differences in terms of the size of the brain um, and it's reliably demonstrated that the size makes no difference in terms of its, so male brains are not any better than female brains, despite the fact that they are you know, considerably bigger. Uh, and individual variation in terms of our intellectual capacities doesn't correlate with the size of our individual brains, which vary enormously. So those are just two little footnotes. Yeah, no, so super, super relevant. And people often say, you know, I'll, I'll talk about some kind of example, you know, this tree frog that remembers where all the babies are and says, oh, with that tiny little brain, it can do it. And I say, did you have an expectation for what the size should be for that? Because I don't have a clue. I don't have any, any clue what the size should be for a given set of competencies, right?